Good evening and welcome to our second session of the virtual Deer Trails Matchless program. My name is Diana Stenberg and I'm TLC's Deputy Executive Director. Our Deer Trails Matchless program was first launched in 2019 in the Clearwater River Valley, where TLC protects more than 140 acres of meadow, wetlands, and forests. The program was designed to provide opportunities for the transfer of naturalist knowledge between generations. Unfortunately, we had to cancel our in-person Deer Trails Naturalist program this year, but we are thankful to our volunteer instructors for offering these virtual sessions. We're looking forward to hosting an in-person event next spring, and we'll be sharing details soon. One of TLC's founders, one of the inspirations for the program, continues as a naturalist instructor and will be sharing with us tonight. Brandy Penn is an author, illustrator, educator, and naturalist. Brandy has written countless articles and books, gained her PhD in geography from Edinburgh University, lectured at UVic in the environmental studies and restoration programs, and worked with local and provincial environmental organizations and indigenous communities. Her chosen topic tonight is synchronicity, nature, and meaning. Welcome, Brian. I picked the topic of synchronicity because it was a, uh, coming up to winter solstice and I thought something that would be a little more, uh, well, just kind of um, lateral for everybody, especially the scientists and um, who might be struggling under a depressing uh, amount of depressing news. And uh, so I picked synchronicity, nature and meaning, because I think it's really a fabulous tool for connecting people to the natural world. I've certainly, certainly been something that has um, connected me. And it was, my mother was a great uh, sort of practitioner of synchronicity and she, she always attributed it to her Welsh roots. And, um, and I realized how much as a child, how much it kind of brought meaning and kind of like a juiciness and to the day when these synchronistic events would happen. So uh, synchronistically, I thought, well, how do I approach this topic? I could sort of start with, you know, a kind of um, historical analysis of Carl Jung's coining of the phrase, which he used as part of his uh, psychotherapy techniques. And he was very interested in how to connect people with, with their emotional life. And so he found that synchronistic events, so synchronicity is, is kind of where an external event um, uh, sort of happens and coincidentally coincides with some kind of internal event that you're having. Um, so something, either dream or a thought or a motion or something, and there's an external event, and then there's this internal event, and they coincide, and it it suddenly engages your emotional life and your and, and your and your intellectual. So he used it as a as as a tool, and he uses the um, description of how one of his uh, clients, who was a uh, middle-aged woman who is suffering from all sorts of um, depression and anxiety and, and meaninglessness. And she talked about a dream that she'd had about this. She'd been given this beautiful jewel that was a golden scarab beetle. And as she was recounting this dream, Jung heard this little tapping at the window and he looked out there and it was a golden scarab beetle that had landed on the glass. And he brought in the the scarab beetle and he said here's your scarab beetle and immediately it kind of broke down her kind of intellectual resistance and she suddenly got into her emotional body and that was the start of the therapy that indeed freed her and up from her depression so that was kind of the start that was Jung's start of of this of of identifying something that of course any any probably every human being used to employ um, prior to Western sort of structures and systems that that emphasize the kind of intellectual side of our 
our our brain and 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 discredited this kind of emotional life um and so in true fashion i thought okay how am i going to illustrate this idea of synchronicity and i opened up my my sketchbook uh where have i got it well anyway this is the page the one that i'd started when we were up at um clearwater and there i opened it up and it said trevor delivered his naturalist intelligence and a merlin appeared which to me was a beautiful synchronicity because i whenever i think of of trevor i think of merlin absolutely utterly he's always transforming into something and and then and there he was and there and there was the merlin and so that was that you know whenever i have these little synchronicities i have to draw them because there's something in them right and so I actually went and did a bit of a deep dive um, because I'm I'm working on a on a book right now about two seabird scientists, and um, there's this whole connection to um, uh, in in terms of in, in a sort of in their development to Merlin, and and I won't go into all the long complexity of it but anyway because of that i was doing some research into merlin the life of merlin and i went i, I went back to the original jeffrey monmouth account of um of merlin and i think um what i'm just gonna pull this up because it's just really quite a um for a minute and then so what a lot of you probably don't know is that the original Merlin was very, very different from um, uh, from the uh, kind of Walt Disney version of Merlin. Merlin was a um, a, a king in the Welsh kingdom of Diffith, and he had just been pummeled by the Normans, going through a series of wars, and he. Uh, and, and in the in Geoffrey of Monmouth's version of it, he ascribes this. I'm just going to read it briefly. This little saying that that Merlin says about um, what he's just been through, and um, and then uh, uh, I call it the the, the first great anti-war speech of the second millennium. So I'll just read it to you. Normans, go, no longer take your armies of violent soldiery through our native kingdom. There is nothing left to fill your maw. You've eaten up everything that creative nature has until now produced out of her fertile bounty. Curb the lions, put a stop to war and give the kingdom peace and quiet. Well, I don't know about you, but that really sounds to me like, um, sounds like uh, Trevor. Um, oops, so that sounds like Trevor uh, dealing with the uh, attack and the assault on caribou habitat in, you know, in his, in his, his on his landscape. And, um, and the other thing about Merlin too, is that as, as this kind of post-traumatic stress disordered king of Diffith, he he called upon the um what were called the galanatse morgan morgan le fay was actually a healer and she was was alleged to have lived on this island and far from being a kind of wicked witch she was actually a great healer and so she was the one that actually taught merlin um all about the birds and there's a whole description in in jeffrey munma's book about how this healer had taught Merlin how to calm down his, you know, he had shell shock, he was PTSD. And uh, he, it, this whole book is really a testimony to how um, the healers took these war-torn men into nature and healed them. So I feel like in, in terms of synchronicity, those are the kinds of outcomes that you can have, right? You've you've you you sort of have connections you have thoughts and then the external world is kind of always presenting opportunities and your mind 
suddenly if it's if it's if you're in the flow you'll you'll suddenly see those connections and you never quite know where those connections go but they certainly give you meaning and and it certainly it, it becomes part of how you deal with your day and how you rationalize and how you understand how crazy this world is and especially now when we've got so many of these kind of crazy normans unleashed upon the land which are causing these crazy floods in the i mean it's just you know the norman's gone mad norman's on steroids is is british columbia's forest industry and um and so uh to me it's just like a beautiful way to explain what synchronicity is and why it's important for i mean i think to at a personal level for for putting the pieces of ex your external and internal world together Okay, so I've got a bunch of these and I'm just going to work through I decided I thought okay well I'm just going to use my my sketchbook because my sketchbook always has these weird I write I do little synchronicities and sometimes there's synchronicities in them that I didn't even realize so. Um, I also thought this might be useful for people coming to Clearwater because these are the instructors and there we have Trevor and Andy McKinnon and I think Andy had been talking about. Uh, they're either Trevor or Andy, you know, they're always talking about obligate relationships. And as I was standing there, I was realizing the two of them had very much an obligate relationship. And and then on the other side, I had, um, you know, been uh, uh, so it's a it's a little synchronicity, but it's it's kind of, um, you know, the 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 essence of it. I, I would say synchronicity is on a big continuum from very coincidental that just kind of makes you go, wow, that was weird, to, oh, that was just kind of lovely. That was just like making these connections. That's how I see it. Um, and, and in this obligate relationship, I had been drawing um, the Supalali. And then, uh, you know, I was, I was sort of, the only reason I drew the Supalali is I was so struck by their praying hands you know, these two hands together. And um, when in their in their little budding out phase. And, you know, and then of course, we start hearing from Trevor all about the obligate relationships of or, or maybe it was Andy on the mycorrhizal uh, associations with with the with the Shepardia, Shepardia canadensis. Um, and so it just was, and, and then they then that made me start pondering because I looked at this book and I went, well, I also drew a tree frog because I was really struck by it that day because you it it had found a little patch of um, where the bark had obviously been uh, knocked away or something by by either a you know a wind blow or something, but the the frog was like right on this little wetter patch little microclimate forming in this little sort of hollow on the on the bark and it got me to thinking about well you know what what are what would be the obligate relationship i mean a tree frog is clearly dependent upon a tree <laughs> uh in many ways mostly for habitat but is there a symbiosis there and was this here and was there something that I don't know like would spores land on the you know the little the frog is its movement across and and liking this particular little um so anyway it's the kind of it's the kind of wandering of the mind that I think is veers between just scientific curiosity and a sort of synchronistic event so I'll just leave it at that one because I think it's kind of fun. Okay, where's the next one? Um, well, this one was kind of a, a an interesting one. I had I had been um, asked to moderate a um, a forum, a scientific panel where there was the world specialist on zombies. I knew nothing about zombies, and he um, he had talked about. This particular his specialty was this particular liver fluke that was in had been brought over from Europe. It had got in, it jumped from sheep to deer, 
the liver fluke exited the 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 the, the, uh, the body of the deer you know after it had lived and and laid its eggs and then then the eggs had this really bizarre series of things happening where they were picked up by snails and then they were um uh, sort of semi-digested and then they picked up by ants and then the ants got infested their, their heads got infested by the the tiny larvae of these liver flukes and then they it caused them to crawl up to the top of a grass chomp on and um and then be there so when the deer ate it the larvae would get into their system and start the whole system again anyway so i i just thought this was so bizarre and it happened to be that the epicenter of canadian this canadian in the uh, uh, researchers, his all his research was taking place on Salt Spring Island, where we had apparently more of these zombie ants than anywhere else in the world. So I, I, I'm kind of like up on zombie ants, you know, like like for you know more than the next guy in the you know next door. So I'm thinking I know quite a lot about zombie ants. Anyway, <laughs> I think uh, it was Andy that started talking about the cordyceps um the spores that you know grew into the the head of the and i thought what are the odds that i would be thinking about zombie ants from two completely different you know uh life cycles and systems and completely have absolutely no relation to each other but they have exactly the same sort of effect on behavior of the ants Anyway, it was one of my little kind of like crazy, that's weird moments. So synchronistic, I don't know, but it was it was something that I noted and I thought that is very cool. Okay, so here's Lynn. And this is, I thought, okay, we can introduce Lynn now. Um, and she's not here, but hopefully which one day she'll hear this. And um, Lynn had said, I'm going to take you to my favorite place, um, Lac du Bois Uplands. And I thought, Lac du Bois, that's weird. Because I had just finished writing this like epic, epic book. Can't see it, but anyway, the real thing, 690 pages. And Lac du Bois features very highly in it because the chief mentor and teacher, the very first teacher and mentor of the uh, subject of the book, Ian McTaggart Callan, was a fellow called George Spencer. And George Spencer uh, was an entomologist and he also taught at UBC, but every summer he went off to this little cabin in the Lac du Bois. And um, I had, you know, I had been around in different parts of campus, but I'd never actually been to Lac du Bois. So for me to suddenly be taken there and said, this is my favorite place was really exciting. I thought, well, you know, like there's a lot of lakes um, in BC and we could have gone to a lot of lakes. But the significance of this for say all the students is that George Spencer as an entomologist was an amazing entomologist. He was a naturalist extraordinaire. He, and, and, and the extent to which he was so brilliant is that he spotted the impacts of DDT back in the night in, in the 40s. He was watching what happened to these insect populations. So he had embarked on a tour with his friend, Mr. Buckle, Mr. Spencer and Mr. Buckle, and Trevor probably met them. Did you meet them, Trevor? Mm, no, not in my time. Not in your time. They may have died already. And so Mr. Spencer and Mr. Buckle um conducted a tour they went round to all the sort of women's institutes and the agricultural institutes of rural british columbia and said do not use ddt it is deadly okay this is 1946 long long before rachel carson so to me this was like another example of um, you know, how we don't even, you can't be a prophet in your own land. So poor Mr. Spencer, Dr. Spencer, um, had been completely, you know, sidelined by his own faculty and his own agricultural bosses and the politicians. 
you know, and it and it took a book being written 6,000 miles away and then being transported and 30 years later before we did anything about DDT. But this, so this landscape had a lot of significance to me and, um, and even more so because when I was working on the book, my best friend who I was, had been teaching natural history, like she and I had been teaching children, like little naturalist clubs. We'd been running a naturalist club for 25 years. And we had, we kind of knew each other's backgrounds, but you know, we didn't really kind of like go deep into our family histories or anything. Anyway, while I was working on the book, I asked her if she could help me. And I said, you know, I need some help with this. And um, because there's a lot of details to follow and she's a great naturalist and she's, you know, and, she, and she's really interested in entomology. And so I said, oh, well, you know, do you, have you ever heard of this guy called George Spencer, who was an entomologist that was um, uh, Ian McTaggart Cowan's prof? And she goes, well, that's my grandfather. And I said, George Spencer is your grandfather? Are you kidding? Anyway, it, it, it completely, we suddenly looked at ourselves and realized that, you know, like ancestors and all these things that overlay and insects and how these, these familial or whatever. So there's external and internal things going on. And when they cross over, we were like, yep. We were meant to write this. The ancestors are having their way on it. So, Lac du Bois has a lot of lot of um, meaning to me. And who should I run into? But Lynn Baldwin. This is her favorite place in the world, and she brings this beautiful life to 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 uh, Lac du Bois. Okay. So this is another moment at Edgewood. Um, I'm walking along, and there's a nest. Love nests budding up through the cottonwood, very kind of scruffy nets with these beautiful blue eggs. And the thing is, is that every time when Trevor had told me Edgewood, I would call it Wedgewood because my grandfather worked for Wedgewood and his, he, he had worked with this very beautiful color called Wedgewood blue and it designed all these china plates with this very unique glaze that was top secret and it's called Wedgwood Blue and it's still top I didn't even know if they you know it's one of those top secret glazes anyway I was really excited about it because these eggs had this beautiful sort of it's a very kind of gray blue and and uh, so I did a quick little sketch and then the next day we're out at Helmkin Falls and I'm just noticing Wedgwood Blue everywhere and I keep writing Wedgwood instead of Edgewood. So I'm clearly into Wedgewood. And I come across this little Swainson's thrush egg on the trail, which is identified by probably you, Nancy, or somebody. And because I'm not, you know, I don't know all my eggshells. Be an oologist is a specific, well, Trevor probably did. Did you? You know it. Anyway, and then there was this beautiful Peltigera with this cyanobacteria freckles, which was very similar blue. And I was just like, and then this blue in the waterfall. And I was like, oh, this is just like Wedgwood Blue Day. And then I realized, oh, the nest was probably Swainson's thrush because it would have exactly that. So the nest I'd drawn coming across this and tying back into the blue and and my grandfather was an artist and a and this potter had a lot of meaning to me meant that i could i'll never forget a swainson's thrush egg now and i learned something about a peltigera that was like wow which was very cool and then it just so it aided my my learning capacity suddenly i was like hmm my, my brain was just ready to absorb all this. Oops, come back. Okay. okay. Um, so here we have Curtis. I just wanted to, this is sort of like, was gonna be an invi uh, like a, you know, invitation or a guide to the uh, naturalists of uh, Edgewood. But here's Curtis and 
I was realizing, like, I was so fascinated by his, his like dissertation on the Taraxacums, dandelions. Um, the fact that they are creating next generations without any asexual or, I mean, and not, without any pollen, sex, whatever. And, um, and I was kind of fascinated by all that. And then I, and then, and then there was this whole concept of, you know, like the, the Celts moving through and moving these dandelions with them, which took me back to Merlin. And, and suddenly there was these, you know, like these, these, these ties to both our, our ancestry in Europe and our, and our, and our relationship to this land in this new place. And, um, and I, and I felt like this was like the whole metaphor for it was a really, you know, I, I totally expected Curtis to just write this, this genus out. Like, I just really didn't think he would be interested in it. And that's, you know, that was like what it, 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 um, it, there was just a moment, there was a learning moment for me that, and then of course we get taken up and we start thinking about resilience and what is beautiful is resilient Gregory Bateson's and, um, and the whole idea of Merlin and this resilience that we have, even though we've gone through these I mean, imagine being in Britain after the Normans have just laid waste to that place, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it was very much similar to what we've done in British Columbia. Very good clan systems. They're just blown out of the water by uh, colonizers moving in very quickly. I come, of course, from half Welsh, half Normans. Like, no wonder I'm so good. <laughs> um, Okay, so now I'm going to take you to Trickett Island. Uh, does anyone, everyone know the significance of Trickett Island? Um, this has got the oldest, longest continual, do you know Diana? Yes, no. This is the longest continuously occupied site in, that is, that is documentable back to 15,000, 15 and a half thousand, I think, thousand years. Um, and it's a little island in, the, in a place called the Spider Archipelago. And it's uh, southwest of Bella Bella. And um, I've been to Trickett many times. And um, because I started, just to go back to Ian McTaggart Cowan, um, he had once told me that when he was searching this coast, um, and he was sent during the war, which makes me think he was probably sent as part of military intelligence, because why else would you be out there in 1940? Um, because later they put a low flying air radar uh, station out here because the next stop is sort of Japan. Anyway, Chicken Island um, is is an it's it's got this one of those sort of profound places where you think, wow, this is yeah, this is a fifteen thousand year old site because you can see the, the the stratigraphic layers all down. But I was there because I'd originally gone there back in years ago, twenty years ago, to start researching sandhill cranes because the sandhill cranes. When he went to the birds of British Columbia that came out in the 90s, it said, we don't know where the, you know, this particular Rowanai species canadensis goes because um, uh, uh, they just disappear. And so um, Ian knew, he said, oh yeah, they're on these islands, these tiny little islands, and they just go running up like rabbits up to the bog at the top of the island. And then uh, they nest there. And he said, yeah, I saw one there in 1939. And it was a chicken and spider on uh, at the lagoon. And yeah, so I went there and there they were. 
like 60, 70 years later. Not the same pair, but it felt like it. Anyway, so I have this little special thing about Trickett Island. And so I got there and August 20th is about the time when they're starting to, you know, think about leaving and they're, they've fledged their chick and um and so i arrive there and we i come by paddle this time I came by kayak this time and i sat there i looked up and suddenly sure as there they were look through the forest and there they were and um and I think it's, I don't know if this constitutes synchronicity, but it's, I think it is in that realm as well, where you, you, you're anticipating, you have, you know, kind of an idea that they're going to be there. But I think it's that when they do occur, and, and there's a whole lot of other things that, that happen, and it just so that that also kind of connected them with the time and who I was with and um this is where I met my my partner uh because of these cranes and so it was it was just a really kind of you know I think for all of us we always have these like powerful moments when we're you know falling in love and you know these are kind of like um these are the things that you build your relationships on right and it's, it's the thing that if you're trying to connect people to the natural world, you just got to, I mean, I think I wrote one of the, one of my essays I wrote for a, an anthology with sex in the city and love in the forest is that, you know, these are the things that actually cement long-term relationships when you have these synchronistic events where you, you've got a personal connection to this thing and you're hoping it's there and suddenly boom, it's there and it, it speaks to you. So um, right after that, we were camping just around the next island. And I was telling um, Jeff, my partner, all about um, a guy called Elroy White. Elroy White is a Heltzik archaeologist. I worked with Elroy 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And when he was a camp counselor at the Quay camp, and he was pretty young then and he was just starting off on his career as an archaeologist and he was one of the key archaeologists that had done a lot of this um, work on these sites and um, had done you know the original there was one I don't know if you ever remember hearing about it but the footprints in the clay um, the 13 and a half thousand year old footprints and and you know this is this is a human relationship with this this place that goes back 13 and a half thousand years it's you know it's like th these are people that have been around this place for a long time and it just feels like it does feel like it's like walking into the equivalent european would say walking into the cathedral or whatever anyway so i had been telling jeff all about elroy because elroy had really just like um become you know, this really eminent archaeologist. And as we're sitting on this beach, you know, Elroy turns up. It's seven o'clock in the morning and he turns up in his little punt and he's bringing uh, another archaeologist around to show her this other site, which he thinks is even older. Anyway, that would be coincidence. Um, some would say that the ancestors were just connecting us. I mean, it was so funny because he looks at me and he goes, Brian, and I went, Elroy? <laughs> I mean, Elroy should have been there, but why was I there? I don't know. So probably because of the cranes. Um, so uh, how are we doing on time? I could go on forever on these stories. So I just did a few and I, what I wanted to do. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna just do one, one, one more. This is, or I'll just do a few more. This is um, uh, Ian McTaggart Cowan. Uh, every, every all the time of working on Ian, it was full of synchronicities, and he was a small mammal specialist, and he had been at Hakai also the same time he had been out around Spider Island. He told me about these uh, these little shrews 
that foraged in the intertidal zone. And, you know, no one else had ever told me about trues that forage in the intertidal zone. Only he would know about trues foraging in the intertidal zone. So I'm, I had never seen, I've been on the coast all my life. I've never seen a shrew in the intertidal zone. I go, after I finish the book, I go to Hakai. I've got this hot little book in my hand. I'm walking along the trail at Hakai, exactly where he saw a shrew. And there was a dead one lying on the trail. Now, the thing is, is that I could have tried to trap one of these in the middle of the night and set up my little small mammal traps, but I wasn't very successful. I actually did try. But the fact that the shrew presented itself to me, something had collected it and dropped it, and there he was. And I thought, that has meaning to me. I will not, I, I connect and I'm bonded to this place. And the other thing about the shrews is that these are the only animals, only mammals that survived that big catalytic, catastrophic um, meteor that hit the earth. And it's probably from these little shrewy creatures that all humans have, have, have evolved. And I thought, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen all over again. All of us are going to like blow each other up in climate change. And it's going to be just like the nightmare. But the only thing is going to survive are these frigging little shrews right at Hakai because that place has been stable for 15 and a half thousand years. And they're probably going to go underground and they're probably going to be able to survive on these little larvae because that's one thing that'll survive with climate change. And anyway, that's what all those thoughts went through my head. They gave me hope. They th I thought, well, what the hell? Next time around, maybe we'll produce a better mammal than humans. Anyway, I'm going to tell just briefly the last story. This is my this is my master of synchronicity, Cecil Paul Wahed. There is not one day went by that we he and I did not have a synchronistic event. His name is Wolf with one paw because he lost all his fingers in a in a in an accident. And so he used to keep his hand in a, in a pocket. And every time I think of Cecil, I would see a wolf. Like it was just, <laughs> I even saw a wolf limping once when I was right around the time before he died. So um, here he is. Uh, we were, we were actually, uh, this is one of our trips where we, where we were taking the ashes of one of his friends to put in the Kitlope Lake. And it was, Bruce Hill, Bruce Hill was this old redneck, old logger redneck guy and, and had a kind of dropped his whole life and become, a, you know, kind of a born again, Hanaxala uh, conservation environmentalist because of Cecil. And it worked really hard and, and it helped protect um, the Kitlope. And as we, as we, um, as we, it, the whole the whole ceremony of going up there to put Bruce Hill's ashes into the lake was incredible. But the best part of the whole afternoon is that he threw the the uh, ashes into the lake, and then this redneck grebe comes swimming in, like red neck as you can get, and the laughter and the joy and the sense that life goes on when your best friend dies. It was just, that was one of those sweet moments. Anyway, um, it, it, with Cecil, it would just go on and on. Every time we'd go by the Gips Gallux pole and, and, you know, the grizzly is the main, the, sea, the magic, the sort of a mystical grizzly. It's a sort of sea grizzly. And every time we would go by, a grizzly would walk by for his pole at his, at his old um, community at, at Miskuza. And um, this was a beautiful day when I was out at Kawisas, one of the rivers in, in the Kitlope. And I was telling some of the guests, because I was leading some guests on Maple Leaf, and I was telling them the story about how frogs are the most sacred animal to the, to the Kanaxla. And if you kill a frog, you will die. That is basically the moral of the story. So, um, Anyway, I was telling them this story and I was looking out for frogs 
and there's toads there and there's actually more amphibians in this whole region than probably anywhere else in British Columbia. It's kind of a weird place where the interior frogs and the coastal frogs and amphibians and everything. I've even seen white, you know, like a, albino newts and it's a crazy place. Anyway, I'm sitting there and this raven comes flying over our head, squawking away with this thing dangling out of its, its um, mouth. And, uh, well, no, no, I'd seen two ravens sitting on, in the estuary around this pool in the estuary. So a saltwater pool. And, and then one of them had just suddenly flown off with this thing in its beak. And I was like, what was that? That looked, that looked like a frog or something. So I went over to the pool and I had just finished talking about, you know, the sacredness of life. And I reached into the pool. It was a big pool. It was probably like, you know, like six, seven feet across diameter. I reached in the pool and my hand went straight onto this toad. There's this toad in the picture you can see in the, it was this incredibly big toad and it had just lost its mate to one of those ravens flying off. And I just like, I, my heart went out, to this. but it was sort of magical because I hadn't intended. I just reached in and pulled it out and all the guests thought, oh my God, how did she do that? And it was completely just like this weird thing that happened. But again, it, it, I think that the teaching, it enabled the story then to really talk about connection and synchronicity and the teachings of indigenous teachings, because that is, that is, as Cecil would say, the ancestors are watching over us and you really feel it. And I don't care if it's true or not, it is the, it's what you feel and it's what you, it gives you courage it gives you to face what the shitty stuff we're going through right now and um and i and i want to communicate it to you because i think everybody has huge capacity for it um it's just you just need to stay open to the moment and and let your intuitions kind of like be stay curious and let your intuitions go and then follow those curious leads so I think I'm going to leave it there. I'd love to hear about anyone's synchronicity stories, if they have any, in our last 15 minutes. Well, first off, I just want to say <clears throat> I really enjoyed this, and uh, and I believe you. I utterly believe you. It's not, you know, as somebody who sees himself somewhat as a scientist, it's not whether it's true or not. Just as you said, it's true if you feel it is true. And that's where the meaning is, and that and that has agency. And yeah, you know, my life is full of those kinds of things. I I used to say, no, that doesn't make sense. Don't do it because it doesn't make sense. I don't I don't I don't care. You should see the, the projects I'm involved in. They're all nonsense, but they just feel like things that I need to do because of because of coincidences, if you like, or synchronicity or serendipity. They're just things that come to come to come together. I go to bed at night and wake up with something in my head, and it, it happens again and again and again, and and I'm told in various ways, no, carry on, carry on, and I and I and I just I believe it. I mean, it, it, I, if there's a if there's a scientific explanation, it has to do with with intuition, the reality of intuition. We 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 intuit things that already that we're already open to, and and in, so we notice what we're sort of thinking about, but it re reaffirms what we think we know, and it brings it to the surface, which is seems to me entirely what you're talking about. Anyway, I'm with you totally. Thanks, Trevor. I think that's yes. And I think almost every scientist really that I know uses this faculty a lot. It's just that you can't talk about it too much. Otherwise, you're considered flaky or something, you know. Yeah, has anyone else got um, some examples? Karen. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just, it was at Deer Trails. Uh, it, I think it's one of my favorite moments at Deer Trails. Tori, Tori and I were outside and uh, we were washing the dishes and like the little setup out there. 
And one of the cutting boards Tori had was cleaning was just this really thin plastic kind of sheet. And as she shook it in the air to dry it off, you know, it was making this thunderous sound and she's going thunder. And for some reason, I just clapped my hands lightning. And then all of a sudden out in the sky, you know, it was a day that looked like, you know, there was going to be thunder with all of a sudden it was thunder and lightning. We just looked at each other like, oh, we predicted the weather. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a good moment. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Yes, that's a perfect synchronistic moment. And yeah. see how it bonds in your mind? Because there's this connection between your emotional, like your emotions and your and your intellect. And it really is, it really aids memory too. It aids memory and yeah, all sorts of things. Great one. Thanks. Mm, well, I'll make a kind of a, a true confession. I've never told anybody this. So it'll just be between the five or six of us <laughs> or whoever listens to this later. Um, for years, I've been following deer trails. And as I'm not possessed of the kind of memory for space, the spatial memory that a deer would have, or a, a wolf would have, or or a purple would have had, or or um, kabuki has, I, I help myself along <clears throat> with um, by tying these little ribbons, these plastic ribbons, in places where where the going's a bit a bit tricky, and I I, I want to remember where I was. And I've always wondered, and then I then I, then I remove them at some point. So I, I have hundreds of these ribbons that are that I've that I've recycle again and again and and um, but this is almost a synchronicity but it's the same I general idea I have this idea that so long as I take the ribbon off the tree and it doesn't matter how cold I am how heavily it's raining how late I am for lunch or whatever whatever it is it's my duty to untie it not to leave it tied because if I leave it tied I tell you, I'm telling you, this is true confession. My sense is the world will end. It's absurd, but I have the sense that it's that it's my responsibility. I have this personal responsibility to keep the world going, and this is how it's done. Not, this is not very different from indigenous peoples, you know, welcoming the sun back, um, um, you know, in the, in, after the equinox or whatever. It's just this sense that I have some sort of again agency in the world. You know, do I believe it? That's neither here nor there. It's what I do, and it feels like it's a very important thing to do. And I'm not about to test whether it's real or not by not by not by leaving the knot uh, tied on the on the, the, the ribbon. The, the most trivial thing you can imagine, but it's it's part of just do I am. I think so. that that's really interesting because I know that children. It's something that children would would absolutely create some little ritual um and i think that you know for some of us we never lose that i think trevor and i could probably describe ourselves as you know a, an element of the child that never grew up <laughs> oh my God, yeah. um but i do like i i i know that you know like th that that there's there's a, a sort of ritual that um children can yeah, so I think I'm, I'm interested, I'm really interested in that because I think that feeling of agency is when, when you don't have any agency. We can't, there's <laughs> the thought of just saving this world right now is just so, you know, not, I mean, the Buddhist tradition would say, you know, give up any of that sort of hubris that you've got any role. But I think that it is very difficult to live a life where you feel that you that things are going to hell in the handbasket and you have absolutely no control over that destiny. And yet you see, you know, what the people that do and you can't influence them. And so I think creating these little rituals actually is is kind of good for mental health, to be honest. Oh totally. I totally I, I'm, not, like I'm not I'm not joking. I, I save the world almost every day. <laughs> sometimes several times <laughs> literally that's what i do and you try to prove me wrong i, get <laughs> I, it. I totally get it because i can it's imagine real. it's not real it doesn't matter what it is it's how it feels yeah and therefore and therefore right it's 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 like brushing your teeth only yeah. brushing your mind and, and 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 it shines and gleams and and, and life is okay because because there is this way i'm helping things 
Yes. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Trevor. Thank you, Trevor, yeah. for sharing that. It's beautiful. <laughs> true confession. True confession. <laughs> uh, well, Diana, do you have any? Or, um, I can't think of one that's necessarily tied to nature. Not that I maybe haven't had them, but um, I think more whether it's spiritual or intuition or maybe maybe the passing along of DNA or trauma or something, but definitely my, you know, the feeling of my ancestors being there with me and having moments where I've had like, like a literal message in my ear, sort of, you know, I was, yeah, there's this one time I recall my, my first car with my, my grandfather's, it was an 82 Volvo <laughs> and, and I was driving down the road and I could hear him tell me to slow down and, um, I just, I could very clearly hear him. I could almost see him in that passenger seat. And I went around the corner and I slowed down and there were like cops setting up like a radar, <laughs> you know, stop. They were, you know, they would have definitely caught me speeding, but I just, I heard him, I saw him and I slowed right down. And I thought, oh my goodness, my pop really just <laughs> really right there for me. It was just amazing. But there've been a couple of moments like that in my life. Definitely when I went to, um, I traveled to Scotland, which is where my, my grandparents are from. And I just, it was just remarkable to be in that landscape. And I just felt like this is where I am from. Like, I just, it just resonated in me. It was, um, I've never had anything like feel like that before. That was, that was pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very, I think that kind of, you know, landscape the the, the, you know the the kind of being connected to landscape is a really it's a very strong one a lot of people have it yeah thanks yeah nancy or shri i i'd have to think about it a long time i'm sure i have i can remember times of my life especially when i'm out just watching and i spent a lot i've spent a lot of my time in a little tent just watching birds that's my favorite times um and i'm sure things have happened but i can't i can't think of any at the moment no but i'm sure they have yeah yeah what about are you there there yeah. So sometimes for me, it happens around death. After my father died, um, I saw a pheasant on the side of the road and I'd never seen one in that area ever before. And he really liked pheasants. He had a stained glass pheasant. He had salt and pepper shaker pheasants. And it just seemed a real symbolism of that he was around in another way. I, I don't know. Yeah, so no, that's a beautiful one. That's very, very common. People talk about in fact, I, I just brought this image onto the screen because Cecil had, when he was burying his, one of his daughters, um, his, her name in Hinaxla was, um, was the humpback whale. And as, as, as he went to uh, take her body back to the, their burial ground up in the, in the Kitlope, um, a big humpback came out and and surfaced while he was there so that was exact same with the pheasant you know like those I think that's how it starts for a lot of people and and you can just kind of take it you can take it up a notch you can build that into every you know every element of your life um, on a daily basis and I think that's one of the things I kind of wanted to introduce to the to you know the participants at um at at deer trails because i think it's a great gift i've used it teaching a lot where student i'll get students to say okay let's pick an animal that you want to be for the workshop and then over the course of that workshop or that day or that whatever camp or whatever we're doing um they'll suddenly come across it and It'll be in a moment that is, you know, somehow quite meaningful to them, and um, you know, it just it just helps it by it bonds them to that animal, and that's the relationship starts, and and from there one relationship leads to another, and 
and so on. So it's kind of a technique and a tool, but you've, you know, you've already experienced it. You've all experienced it in some way. And it's, it's, um, I just find it this absolutely beautiful tool to, um, uh, to, to use in, in trying to increase our connection to the natural world. You know, Brian, there are, there are times when <clears throat> the synchronicities simply aren't to be seen. They're nowhere to be seen. They disappeared. And quite the contrary, you find blockages. And yeah. I used to be the sort of person who would be very angry at the blockages and say, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, no, I'm going to persevere. And it, it's a strange thing because more and more when there's a definite, when the universe seems to be conspiring against something, it's no longer just my a question of my having to work hard and, and do the ridiculous. I do the ridiculous anyway, but, but the universe actually opposing it, you know, um, some, some, some plan that was integral to, to, to X, Y, or Z happening um, uh, just falls to pieces. I'm, I'm increasingly at peace with that. And I simply say, well, it's not, it's meant, I'm being told if I just were smart enough that, that no, this, that this was a bad idea. Don't, don't go that direction. And I think, I think all told, this is just about Again, I guess I said earlier, intuition, just these senses you get and that, th that this is the right way forward or this is not the right way forward. But they're not intuitions that you're sort of, um, you know, just coming up with uh, in the middle of a, of a daydream. There are things that are happening around you that seem to point in one direction or another and, and to allow yourself to, to live according to dictates of, of, of those yay and nays has been a, a kind of a great relief for me and, and a great... Um, a giver of, of, of freedom and 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 um, and and just just general well-being to kind of just go with it and uh, many things i've wanted to do i thought were important but the your world has told me in many ways don't go don't go there and so i don't and i don't ever find out in many cases whether there's anything to be uh you know gained by not doing it it's not like and turning coming around a corner and there being a bunch of cops with a speed trap it's not, it's not, it's not like that i never really know but i'm but my my intuition is that it would be like that if i if i carried on something something really um you know i mean I, that i was giving a given a shot across the bow um such and such didn't happen this is a shot across the bow and some other thing didn't happen another shot across the bow if i keep persisting and the, the shot is going to come a little closer <laughs> to hitting me personally and, and yeah. so i don't yeah. yeah, I think that's a really great, actually, I think that's a really great place to, I mean, we're at the end of our hour, and it's, I think it's a beautiful place to close, because, um, you know, these things can't be forced in a way, as you say, and, and, and there's so much, um, there's, there's, uh, there's so much to be had by um, being able to, to kind of understand the, 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 the tool, but also, you know, your, inter, your interaction with, I don't know, it's, I think it's, um, it's part of that deep um, wisdom that we're all kind of trying to help promote in this time and um non-action and non-synchronicities can be just as, as strong indicators i know that when i'm in the flow when things are going well and i'm in the right place and doing the right thing i have endless synchronicities when i'm doing the wrong thing and there's no synchronicities just as you say i'm like i'm not doing the right thing it's time to get out and uh so it's a great it's a great indicator yeah, well, thanks, everyone. I don't know if there's any more questions, but. Thank you, Briny. That was great. I, I yes. feel Thank you very, very much thoughtful. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Great. Take good care. Take good care, everybody. Okay. Good to see you Thank again. you all. You too. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, again okay. soon.